You want to start, sir? As I said, uh, ben, we can do introductions. Ben, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, sure, sure. Perfect. Uh, good morning, everyone. It looks like John, our host, is now in the meeting, too. But uh, I'm going to hand him the mic. I'm not familiar with this platform. I had to hand him the mic. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Ben Stewart. I work with the Tulsa Remote Program here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, native Tulsan, um, and have been a part of our kind of innovation and talent ecosystem for the past 12 years. John, I saw you join the meeting. Do you want to take the reins? Yes, thank you. I, I'm sorry that we had a little bit of a slow start there. I don't know what happened. Um, we've had, I, I've done a couple of sessions before and I had no problems, but it seemed to just kick us in a little bit late. So first of all, apologies. Welcome everyone and our audience to um, Nurturing U.S. Innovation Clustering. Um, it, it's, um, let, me, let me start by quickly introducing the panels. I know you started introducing yourselves and then each of the panelists can, um, can make their contribution to this rather important topic. Um, we, we have Ananth with us, who is the um, Chief Technology Officer of one of the preeminent world consulting firms, Tata Consulting Services. Um, in addition, Bernard, who will be joining us a few minutes later because um, he, he, would, he, he had a conflict, um, Ben Stewart, and, um, who's with Tulsa Remote, and will be explaining the, re the remote program he instituted in Tulsa. Um, <clears throat> Nick Smoot, who I think you started introducing yourself, so thank you. And, um, <clears throat> and Navin, who um, uh, leads, founded and led the um, Innovation Bootcamp, which is a four-step program trying to get um, entrepreneurs effective and enabled and, um, and, and to bring their inventions to success. Um, myself, my interest, I'll be um, one minute just very briefly. Um, I've always been interested in innovation. And in particular, I've been trying to solve some of the problems related to innovation. Um, and just as one example is the one related to how do you market something that's still secret? And we are solving that problem by allowing people to register innovations. They are encrypted. And then um, the kind of encryption used is one that still allows for search. So people are able to register their, um, their in ideas as an encrypted document. It's encrypted before it leaves their browser. We know what people are looking for. We search for those keywords. Um, because the kind of encryption we use allows the document to be searched for keywords, but not allowed to be read. So we maintain the confidentiality, but when we find a hit, in other words, a document that's relevant to what someone is searching for in technology, then um, we don't tell the searcher what it is or who it is, but we do allow them to send a message to the owner of that technology requesting access they can attach a smart contract NDA at the same time. And in that way, they get connected. So we're trying to solve some of these fundamental problems. And all of our panelists are also contributing in their own ways. So um, I believe um, um, one of you, I think it was Ben, uh, wanted to go first because you have to run early. So please, um, you start and um, let us know a little bit more about the Tulsa Road program, and then we'll go from there. Great. Well, thank, thank you, John. You. Um, good morning, everyone, again. I, uh, my name is Ben Stewart. I work with the Tulsa Remote Program, which is a part of the George Kaiser Family Foundation. Um, as I mentioned to John in, in preparation for the panel, you know, this program is kind of an interesting evolution of the foundation. We, we work at a foundation whose mission is equal opportunity for young children and the development of a vibrant and inclusive Tulsa community. And those two things kind of square up in the middle with something like Tulsa Remote, where you see the future of, of an economy that was predominantly dependent on oil and gas, aviation and financial services, diversifying into really interesting innovation and entrepreneurship activities. Through Tulsa Remote, we've brought over 1,500 members to Tulsa. 
the idea nestled, nested within the fact that from 1980 until 2020, Tulsa had seen basically a stagnant population. You hadn't seen the growth that those kind of agglomerating talent clusters of the coastal cities in America paired with the likes of an Austin or an Atlanta. And in order to solve for that, we had a concept of breaking that talent jobs chicken and the egg situation that's so often talked about in the fall of 2018 with the idea that remote workers could bring jobs and people to the community. And with that, we saw the idea launch November of 2018 with over 10,000 people applying for that $10,000 headline number uh, in the first 90 days. And so that really broke open a, a sea of opportunity for the likes of Tulsa's and many other communities across the heartland, uh, especially during the pandemic, where during 2020, we saw 5x the number of applications that we did in 2019, because people were looking at non-traditional geographies, they were unbounded, they were, they were no longer required to go into the office five days a week. And with that came a lot of flexibility and a lot of autonomy, and people have sustained. I think that's the most important point of the Tulsa Remote Program is the community that's been built here and the stickiness of that. So we've seen kind of a mini city within a city where we intentionally foster and develop the community at Tulsa Remote. Um, we have a team of over 20 individuals that help to curate and develop those opportunities and work within the city context to bring Tulsans in to meet our members and ex kind of expose and, and, and create those innovation opportunities within the community. To this end, we've seen 90% retention, um, which is tremendously powerful. We've seen over 400 members purchase homes in our community, which is a great indicator of the long-term stickiness factor. About 45% of our members work in technology, 30% work in business services, and then the rest run the gamut from a Japanese opera singer to a Harlem Globetrotter. Uh, what we see with that though, is also <laughs> average income of about $125,000 and double the, the, the city average. So seeing these, knowledge economy jobs and knowledge economy individuals coming into our community really helps us leapfrog to a different solution state. Obviously the foundation, like I mentioned, has a primary mission of equal opportunity for young children. We're the largest investor in early childhood education outside of the federal government. We see the need to build Tulsa's own talent base as well, but that's a long-term equation. Those are generational changes that we're worth seeking there. What Tulsa Remote helps do is leapfrog to a, a solution set that can bring opportunity back down into our primary mission as well, creating those knowledge economy jobs. And one other statistic I would be remiss not to mention, especially on this panel, is we did an economic impact analysis throughout 2021, surveying over 800 members. And we found that four in 10 are entrepreneurially minded. They want to start their own business. And with that, we want Tulsa to be the backdrop to do that. So we're starting a whole vertical of programming around that because we know that that could be a game-changing equation for all of Tulsa, seeing business creation come from members moving here through the Tulsa Remote Program. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to John, but thankful to be able to give a bit of a, an overview of the Tulsa Remote Program. Thank you. Thank you for that insight. And of course, um, just as I say, all politics is local politics, all innovation starts locally with the individuals in the community. Um, so so next, uh, maybe um, Ananth, um, you were going to talk a little bit about best practices, um, if that's still okay. And we'd appreciate yeah. hearing your insights because we know you've studied it in some detail. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, thank you, Ben, for those uh, very insightful comments. I was not personally aware of the excellent work that you have just described. I'd love to catch up with you offline. But uh, from my perspective, uh, uh, let me just share three uh, essential points that I thought would be relevant to this discussion uh, in the um, in the context of uh, uh, what TCS, my company, does in the innovation space. Uh, we run an extensive network of startup companies uh, where, where we do not invest cash or capital and, and, and money and so on, but we become the conduit through which these startup companies can address a joint market, which uh, you know, we, uh, we as TCS have the privilege of serving uh, the global uh, large corporations in, in multiple industries in multiple parts of the world. And if a startup has something interesting to offer to that market, then we 
create the opportunity for uh, these two entities, the large corporation and the startup company to connect. Uh, we will, of course, uh, get our service revenues uh, in, in that sense, but the intellectual property and the unique uh, offerings of the startups go to market. So this gives us an unprecedented view into global startups. Uh, there are now about 2,500 startups in our network. About half of them are in uh, from the U.S., uh, and the other half, obviously, are from other parts of the world, but, but all the hotspots. So we have startups from Israel, of course, from Canada, from the UK, from Europe, from India, from the Far East, or even Australia and New Zealand in the network. So uh, what I'm seeing is, uh, what I'm going to say here is based on what I see in these different hotspots. Uh, first of all, from a, an India perspective, uh, the kind of nurturing of uh, innovation and in clusters, uh, it is uh, uh, happening in two or three different ways. Uh, one, there are some very large naturally formed clusters uh, around uh, cities like Bangalore, uh, Pune, uh, Chennai, uh, Delhi, uh, the national capital, Mumbai, and so on. And many of those are servicing the local uh, needs. So there's startups in the e-commerce space and in hyperlocal uh, delivery of services, uh, um, you know, food delivery, for example, uh, or they are uh, based on enterprise software uh, needs for the global market. You know, uh, software as a service startups in India, for example, are doing extremely well. Uh, E-commerce is is very popular of all uh, all shades and forms, uh, and that's because of the India market itself, and then healthcare and many other niche uh, areas. Uh, these clusters have uh, formed just, I would say, uh, organically. There have been no specific uh, aha moments in that journey. Uh, you know, a, a few entrepreneurs started in the 80s and then it just cascaded onwards from there. Uh, some enabling uh, environmental factors like there were uh, industri larger industry bodies. The mature Indian software industry played a role for, for nurturing quite a few of them and so on. But mm -hmm. off late, there have been more conscious efforts. Uh, to build these around universities, for example. Uh, so Ben, you mentioned uh, you know, the knowledge-based industries. So deep science startups, which are coming out of uh, research in, um, in the, the Indian engineering schools, the Indian uh, uh, Institutes of Technology or the uh, Indian Institute of Science, uh, the biology uh, institutes, and so on. So there is a whole new generation of these which are coming out of the university ecosystem. And, and that will be very different in character from the... Uh, uh, the sort of early stage uh, ones that were focused on just a few areas of tech, because these are much broader. They are from metallurgy, from bio life sciences, from uh, the hard engineering sciences, and so on. Um, the uh, research parks and the technology parks are uh, often set up in conjunction with an academic anchor institution supported by global alumni and by local industry are playing a big role in, in sort of bootstrapping this, this ecosystem uh, into the next order of magnitude. If I look at Israel, uh, Israel's done something really smart. They've picked basically three or four areas. Uh, they've picked you know, computing, uh, cybersecurity within computing, uh, analytics within, within that, uh, and a few other spaces, you know, water, energy, and, and so on. And the national government, the universities, uh, investors, and, and, and that bootstrap of uh, founders who have exited and, and then they come back and, and, and reinvest back in the same community, that virtual cycle is, is doing wonders in the Israel ecosystem. So as you look at innovation clusters in the U.S., you, know, uh, you might like to see this uh, as we go forward. And my last uh, uh, comment would be the role that large corporations seem to play along with local governments in, in both India and Israel, uh, but also in Singapore. Uh, where there is a, a very large segment of um, both local industry as well as governmental interventions. You know, there are institutions like uh, uh, EDB, uh, the Economic Development Board, or ASTAR, which is a conglomeration of all the different uh, government investments in technology, uh, and large corporations in Singapore, uh, which are playing a hugely positive role in bootstrapping uh, a, a certain direction. So Singapore is making its reputation in, in areas like smart cities and governance, uh, transportation, uh, and, and, and very specialized areas like that where they know they can be world-class. 
and the kind of support and, and and off late you know they're doing a lot in in the life sciences which is coming out like i described in the india case from the university research and so masters and phd students <clears throat> become the core uh, with the faculty become the core of startups very specialized in in cutting edge uh, deep, uh, deep science areas around uh, uh, life sciences this pattern seems to be repeating so i don't know how relevant that is to this discussion but if the universities in the areas that you are describing uh, if they can be involved, local industry or global industry can be involved in some manner. Alumni networks do play a big role. That I've observed in India. I mean, I'm myself an alumnus of the Indian Institute of Technology. So you know, if, if my alma mater is, is nurturing a startup or they want some advice on how to spin it off, naturally, I would, I would go out of my way to help them. And, and if, if my corporation can help them, even better. So th that virtuous cycle seems to help. Uh -huh. uh, and of course, local support, the local community, if it's receptive to this kind of a bootstrap, uh, then it seems to accelerate. That's what the, uh, the Israel uh, example seems to show. So uh, that's a, sort of a, a nutshell of my opening remarks on what, what role these different stakeholders can play in, in nurturing uh, clusters of entrepreneurship. So uh, back to John, I guess. Uh, yes, okay, thank you. you. Thank, th th thank you for that overview, the geographical overview as well. Um, and, and Nick, if, if you could now um, give us some insights into what you're doing with the Innovation Collective. And again, I, it, it seems that it's a, a network of those interested in the innovation process. Um, am I misunderstanding that or is that... No, that, that's very, very accurate, actually. Um, and our process creates space for everyone who's interested in the innovation process. And if anything, we index more heavily on the overlooked people and the overlooked communities. And right. we find a way to invite them into that process uh, with a belief that a lot of the great innovations that move society forward have come from overlooked locations and people. And now those people are not as involved in the clusters. Right. And even when a cluster is set up in Boston or in Austin, um, a lot of those people are the ones who are on the very far outside. Um, yeah. our, our belief in core really believes that capitalism should be an economic driver that gives everyone a seat at the table. And as we've scaled corporations and as we scaled cities post the industrial revolution, we have lost that connective tissue because of scale. And so right. now we need to focus on things that we can execute on effectively. And in that we lose some of the humanity and the relationship and good people and good ideas get squashed. Yeah. So with that premise, uh, we launched Innovation Collective about a decade ago, and it's built around a core system of events that help people discover what's out there and possible uh, and these are through very socially driven events. We run 70 events per year per community. Uh, I personally have been to over 300 small communities in the last decade and have met everywhere from you know, senators and uh, cabinet members in the White House down to the homeless and single mothers, all trying to figure out how do we architect a right pathway that produces the results everyone's looking for. Um, uh, and that's from corporations down. So our, our system, uh, Discover, dream after people discover what's out there and possible in technology and innovation, then it's dream about who you are and what role you could play and then design that pathway to get them there. In the design phase, we typically bring in partners. Uh, so we'll end up having uh, corporations, universities, um, anybody who has an innovation or a talent problem, to be quite frank, mm -hmm. to come in with training tools uh, or other options. And we help design skills pathways for those individuals to learn those new skills, but it also looks at soft skills. Um, how do we help people set a healthier path for their life, their self-talk, money management, goal setting, their relationships? All of these things are often overlooked when people are developing their career uh, for people who've maybe fallen behind. And then finally, after uh, discover, dream, design, then it's deliver. Uh, we work uh, endlessly in the community through a social infrastructure that looks a lot more like a spider web and less like an org chart yeah. where many relationships are supporting those people as they're on their journey to deliver that idea about their concept of an innovation or the idea about the new career that they want. 
So it's um, that exercise of people putting in the energy to become that person and having a community to support them is actually the most powerful part of transformation. So we, um, we love what we do and we've packaged it into a series of products that uh, we coach cities, we coach um, statewide governments, we coach um, corporations, national laboratories, and we also then get hired to come in and create workshops and deliver strategies for how to implement this model. And in that, we also get hired to implement that model. Uh, and really at the end of the day, what it ends up uh, producing is a very inclusive innovation ecosystem of talent that was overlooked and of innovators who were often on the outside. And most importantly, those innovators from the outside bring solutions that the people on the inside have overlooked for years because those people on the outside are the ones that they still change their own oil. They change their own tires. They're not a part of that um, internal club that everyone reads this exact same white paper. Um, They're the people who are far, far, far on the edge. And when you give them a problem to look at, they come with a brand new set of glasses versus the uh, everyone wearing the same ones. So we're having fun. We're in seven different states right now across the U.S., and have done some international work uh, as well uh, for some island nations. That's that, that's great. And um, it, it, that's the thing that I think brings us all together and, and is the topic of the panel is this concept of clusters. And there, there's a couple of studies that are actually quite interesting. Um, one was by Keith Sawyer out of, I think it was Washington University. And he he did research that showed that the uh, um, creative people working together are more productive than the sum of the creative people working individually. And then I think it was Richard Florida did a study. He was out of um, the University of Toronto. Um, He did a study where he compared the rate of patents um, within a geographical area and he related it to population density. Um, and what he found was that there was a strong correlation between the population density and the rate of patent issuance um, per capita. Um, and he, he attributed this to the fact that, again, people were working well um, and interactively. So I think, you know, we all have, um, we're all effectively trying to implement what researchers have shown to be the case that creative people working together produce much more and in slightly different ways we're all kind of approaching that so perhaps um we we have some time now we will be having someone joining us a little late that's bernard moon from spark labs to give us the incubator perspective on everything um but perhaps if you know um i can ask you a couple of questions just to um elaborate starting with Ananth. Um, m- my question to you, um, you know, you talked about best practices and you're leading in best practices um, with, with, you know, some very innovative projects that, you know, I look forward to learning more about. Um, to what extent do you find people are even aware of best practices in the world of innovation in, or if you like more specifically in the world of R and D and um, and the second part of the question is, if if they're aware of best practices, to what extent do you think they follow them? It's a bit of a leading question, but go ahead. <laughs> so, John, uh, you know the awareness is uh, it, it it falls off very very rapidly from uh, the middle of every cluster. So every cluster pretty much knows what their participants are doing and and so on. Would they? Uh, if I look at uh, you know a country like India, uh, you know the people in let's say Bangalore and Chennai, which are about 200 miles apart, uh, would kind of broadly know what what the two uh, be- uh, cities are doing in terms of best practice, but would they adopt them readily? Uh, perhaps not. Mm-hmm. Um, would they know necessarily what's going on in Singapore or Israel or uh, even the U.S. or Canada or wherever? Uh, it, it sort of falls off exponentially from there. And, and would they have heard about what you know Ben and Nick talked about? I don't think so at all. 
right? So it's it's very very local. So that's a problem that hopefully events like this will will solve to some extent if people do pay attention. Uh, however, there are amplifiers. Uh, I call them, you know, you know, passionate people who, uh, you know, in, in, in pre-COVID times would probably travel around between clusters or between cities or between islands of best practice and sort of spread the word. Uh, and just like the, the, you know, the evangelists do so in, in other contexts. Uh, so that's, uh, that connection role it is, is extremely important. Uh, I mentioned the role that, for example, uh, alumni play in connecting large corporations to innovation clusters right. in, in India, in, in Israel, uh, in, in Singapore, and other places. Um, so, you know, that's an example of a passionate set of people who are in one, uh, you know, area of capability, uh, but who are, because of past, uh, you know, academic uh, relationships, have no problem in helping somebody from their alma mater to succeed in, in, a, in a related area. So that's an example of a, of, a, of a very positive reinforcement of that sharing of best practice kind of a story. Uh, the last point I'd like to make is that if um, corporations which are trying to run open innovation systems, and it, it so happens that in my industry, the consulting and technology service industry, that is actually a strategy that many of us follow. Uh, some of my peer uh, uh, companies in, in my industry would do so for acqu acquiring startups, which is okay because uh, you know acquiring a startup is is you know in some ways uh, signing up on the on the success of that startup and with your own investments and then making them part of something much bigger. And more importantly, it frees up the the founders after a finite period of time to go back in and do that same thing again outside right. that large company. Uh, to do that that whole uh, entrepreneurial cycle or inspire other startups. Now, in Israel, I see this happening all the time because, you know, the bootstrapping which has happened there is because of successful exits that founders have had over the years uh, from startup A to maybe a large corporation or an acqu acquisition that, that they've been part of or a merger. And then they come back after a year or two and then they start the whole thing again. And in five right. cycles, they become investors themselves and now they're spreading that best practice. Right. So I think some of the, some or all of these factors I think will play a role. Um, you know, find passionate people, find the people who can cross those boundaries between different stakeholders. Maybe some of them might end up in in, in local government or state or even federal governments to make the, uh, the 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 environment or the governance more equitable for for startups to flourish. Uh, role of local community, role of alumni, role of people in large corporations. And uh, the virtual cycle that sometimes venture money can play in freeing up the entrepreneurial talent to come back and do it again. Right, right. So all of these are, are contributory factors. Uh, and and we, we need them to come back and do, the, do it again because um, it, it is brutal, uh, particularly the first time they go through the process. It's very tough. And, and any ways we can find to help them, whether it's through advice or infrastructure, um, it's it's for the good of the community in general. Yeah, and, yeah. and one, one last thing, uh, John. Sorry to, to interrupt, but no. you know, the, the, the one of the, the reason why uh, it is brutal is that a startup might have a great idea, a great product, or great engineering, or, or great service, connecting to market for the first and the second and the third and the fifth and the fiftieth customer is often that 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 toughest hill that you have to climb. Yeah. Anything which connects you to your first customer, yeah. you know, a, a friend, uh, you know, an angel, an investor, uh, a person in a large company who likes what you're doing, or, or John, the work that you describe that you do, any of those can help you close that first deal, and the, then yeah. the second deal, and the fifth deal, and the fiftieth deal. Yeah. That is a huge positive. So access to market is as important as as you know getting your first financing. Because the right. first financing gets you to the product. Yeah. But you've got to get the financing repaid by some customer who's going to pay you for that product or service that you've created with your investor's money. Right? So I think that access to market is the best practice. More people who can learn about it. Uh, if you get it through working in the TCS co-innovation network to get you your first uh, you know, commercial deal in a, in, a, in a large corporation, that's good. If any other means, you know, just go for it. That, that's, I think, the... The, the, the real learning or the best practice that should be spread far and wide. I agree. And often with that first customer, 
the it's quite rev revelatory for the entrepreneur because they realize they've been perhaps solving the wrong problem or in the wrong way and it's that very first pivot of often quite a few pivots um and and now for mick uh sorry for nick um you you've obviously been out there working with um quite a few large r d organizations researchers you mentioned the national labs um what, without giving away any national secrets, um, what what was perhaps the bigger the biggest revelations for you in terms of things that surprised you that they were doing that perhaps um, they they could have been doing very differently or should have been doing very differently? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And to, to first preface it, I'll say there's incredible people inside of the labs and incredible innovations that they are creating. Um, but I will also say much like large corporations who invest heavily into innovation campuses, um, they don't quite understand startup culture. Right. And much like Vannevar Bush, uh, who started the National Lab movement, um, Vannevar Bush had a perspective of it was kind of these like crazy scientists hacking away on things. And there's been a bit of feature creep over the last, um, you know, decade after decade with the labs that now we have a very structured, rigid system that uh, also has different incentives that are in place for very particular reasons. But as we know in corporations, if you have the wrong incentives in place, you get the wrong results. And so the, the individuals inside of the labs have a mandate that's very clear that that is where they spend their time. Yeah. And yet they have these other ancillary initiatives that they hope to accomplish through culture, through innovation, through setting up spaces. And yet uh, they don't understand why the staffing, much like corporations, don't execute on other areas or why their open innovation labs for a large corporation or an innovation campus isn't utilized well or isn't commercializing things right. additionally, taking the intellectual property in a different direction. Um, so what I, what I found is um, many of those corporations and uh, the clusters are trying to create internally the entrepreneurial efforts All right. and at labs. Um, what's missing is what I would refer to as jazz. Um, jazz is culture. Jazz is something that is happening outside of and in between your work day. Right. You have sheet music which right. is my very structured ship this, do this, get it done. But there must be jazz to have innovation. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Bert Rattan, who is a great innovator, and he's one of my longtime advisors. Uh, I interview him next week. He's in his late 70s, almost early 80s. And he has a statement that you must have confidence and nonsense to have true innovation. And when you think about most companies when they started, most innovations when they started, they're complete nonsense. And that, that belief in nonsense seems to go the way of the dodo as yeah. the corporation goes to scale. And so yeah. um, Safi Bacall, another interesting individual, has done a great job discussing and talking about how do you take care of your little precious baby right. as you grow this giant monster of a corporation. Uh, and often you give up one for the other. So we specialize in that space of how to create culture uh, in those in-between moments where jazz is truly important and learning from the Burt Rattans and the Vannevar Bushes and how do we infuse that not only into national labs and corporations, but also into communities uh, and municipalities, which really it's a bottom up. You have to meet people where they're at, where they feel alive in doing that activity. You can't incentivize jazz. Jazz comes from the soul. Yeah. No, that's an important point. And I think the, um, the tolerance for failure, too, as you move, mm -hmm. when you move to the large corporate environment, then it, goes the floor. They, they, it goes through the floor. Like it's it, people are ashamed. And as much as your manager will say, I want you to take risk. Um, if the incentives don't back that up and if there isn't truly modeled from the top down, it won't happen, period. OK, and I see um, an F nodding, nodding your head. Um, the same question in a way. Um, you, you've talked to many of the people out there. Uh, what shocked you the most about what, what they're doing? What the, that, that seems to be completely mistaken. So. <laughs> You know, I was I was nodding and smiling, uh, you know, when I was talking because you know I do work in a large corporation, uh, and and my job is not just to do all the exciting stuff and research and and innovation and work with startups and universities, 
but also to drive that culture of innovation and risk taking within the larger company. I mean, right. TCS has 5,000 consultants, right? A half a million consultants who don't take risk are are okay, but you know, if they got that little bit of jazz that, that Nick talked about, <laughs> it would be far more successful. So, you know, I had the fortune of uh, being mentored by by uh, Clayton Christensen, the late Professor Clayton Christensen of Harvard Business School. He was on our board of directors uh, for many years, uh, yeah. coinciding with my, my tenure right now as, as CTO since 2005. And in addition to everything that Nick, you said, uh, you know, not taking risk and, and all of that, uh, I would just add one more important point. If the stakeholders, employees in a large corporation are not clear about what's, you know, Clay used to call it the jobs to be done, you know, what's the job that the customer is hiring you for? Mm-hmm. Uh, you have lost it, right? Uh, you know, you're not going to compete on, you know, I don't know, you know, uh, not, not to be disrespectful to the food industry or something. You know, people are not going to come to your, 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 ch- your chain of restaurants because your sandwich is 23% better than the other guy, mm-hmm. uh, you know, or, or whatever. Uh, they come to your, your restaurant to eat something which is quick, healthy, you know, perhaps non-messy. So even a banana is your competition, uh, <laughs> not necessarily a better sandwich, right? So I might be giving a very facetious example, but that's the, the, the extent to which the, uh, the culture of innovation has to be razor focused on what's the job that the customer is actually hiring you for. Customer comes to your restaurant because they are hungry. And, and, and your sandwich happens to be the, uh, 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 the, the, the way they want to fulfill the job at that the point. Solution. The solution, solution to that problem. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, you know, all, and then the rest of it comes in, you know, what risks do you take and, you know, how, how do you learn, how do you, you know, do you, and so on. Uh, and then your incentives, everything else that I totally agree with, with Nick. So if we can, you know, capture that magic in a, in a five-person startup, Everybody right. knows what the customer wants, or at least, you know, the, Johnny used the word pivot. Why do you pivot? Because you can see that the customer doesn't like what your original product is. So you very quickly switch to something else. Right. Large corporation, you, you know, we don't pivot. We, we sort of, you know, like a super tanker turning. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> graceful turns, right? So that's, that's the, the, the only additional part that I'd like to add to what Nick said. Okay. And it, and it looks like Bernard um, wasn't able to join us. Uh, he must have been delayed even further. Um, so so um, we, we can keep going until we get cut off. But at, at least let me um, thank you both for taking part in the panel and our um, ever-changing audience for participating. And, um, and, and again, apologize for that slow start. The Run, run the world, they automatically turn it on at some point and they seem to be late in turning it on. But anyway, we, we all got together. I hope it was useful. I certainly appreciate meeting um, both of you and the others um, you know, who have departed or d- not yet arrived and um, following up. I think we all have a common cause, a common interest. I think it's a very important one. I think it's the fundamentals of the economy and and let's say now also i think it's the fundamental of rebuilding our economy from the uh you know the global malaise it seems to be in and the global chaos we seem to be in um but we can carry on talking i think we can talk for a few minutes and then just cut us off anyway so um any, any additional comments that either of you would like yeah, to add, nick this is this is nick and um i've got to depart in a few seconds as well um but i think in in kind of honoring the theme of nurturing U.S. or drop the U.S., right? Um, nurturing innovation in clusters, period. Yeah, because um, there's really no geographical boundaries to innovation. Well, especially in the world we live in right now. Um, you know, <laughs> anything happens. Butterfly effect has never been more relevant. Right. Something that happens on the other side of the world definitely impacts you today. Yeah. Um, and it's more and more obvious. So to, to that theme, I think I would just say, One of the most crucial things I've discovered over the last decade, working with, you know, the the largest we've we've done talent initiatives with Apple. We've done innovation sprints with Walmart. We've done um, at the same time um, coding boot camps for uh, mothers in a shelter and uh, working with university presidents and governors and senators 
and CEOs of big corporations, the one thing I think everyone really, really, really wants to understand is how do we unleash human capital, the human energy, the human potential is a better phrase than human capital. One feels very transactionary, but the potential that's trapped inside of people, everyone wants that out. I agree. Governors, senators, senators, we talk about oil and gas as a raw material, but the the it is the most innovation is the most precious one of all. And and the one thing I can say um, around nurturing innovation clusters around the globe, we've got to start legitimately have to start with an understanding that the reason why we're not seeing that energy brought to the table for most people is they don't understand where to put it. And so they go and find their own adventures which are truly damaging our globe. I agree. Uh, the way people spend their time to entertain themselves, the way people end up spending their time to find adventure through um, drugs and alcohol and other unhealthy activities. And I know this is about a health component, but we must address these globally as we look at how do we create innovation clusters? Because you can have high-tech communities that are garbage as well, with people yeah. bringing the worst version of themselves. And so I really believe you have to have a holistic picture and what we're bringing to the table when we're trying to say, let's address and get innovation out of folks. Well, let's just address right. this. A human is a human is a human, and they have magic in them, and they want to bring it out. Yeah. And so let's create the right environment to let people start to find that best version of themselves in corporations, through government, in colleges, in communities. So uh, it just needs to be something that kind of haunts us like Casper the Friendly Ghost back here as we look at how do we structure these uh, top-down innovation clusters, and really we need to understand it's bottom-up. And right. if people don't feel inspired to plug in, we'll never get there. No, I agree. Totally agree. Totally agree. So it, 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 it's been very refreshing to, talking with both of you and, and the others that came and went. Um, and I look forward to following up. I think, um, we're all, I think we're all engaged in something that's very important um, and I think can be a major contribution and both there's general solutions and there's specific solutions. And particularly as you as you were saying, Nick, let's bring in some of the less advantaged. You know, we have a program we're working on specifically for female inventors who only account for fifteen percent of patents filed. Um, but by most psychological studies have a little bit more creativity than we men. <laughs> um, and I remember also speaking to the the Black Inventors um, Society of Chicago, down the south side of Chicago. Um, but I actually got disinvited because I dared to suggest that, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to spend the money getting a patent, and there is also the alternative route of trade secrets. And some of the, um, the lawyers who actually ran that organization didn't particularly agree with that message, so <laughs> I got disinvited from the, the second session there. Um, but, you know, let's all keep pressing forward. It's all important stuff. And I hope we all stay in touch as well. Absolutely. And Arthur, it was a, a pleasure. It's good seeing you again. Okay. Thank you, Horatius, for uh, bringing us together. Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you, John. Bye.